Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. As you know, we're getting towards the end of our trip through the Bible. And we're in the book of Revelation, and we're going to be looking at chapters 8 and 9 during this session. Now, in this part of Revelation, there's a lot of talk about judgment. And if we go to the last two verses of chapter 9, there's kind of a summation of what this judgment is all about. So let's read from Revelation 9, uh, verse 20 and 21. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by the plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, and of wood, neither can, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. You know, if they weren't killed by the plagues, they weren't repenting of anything, were they? It doesn't sound like it. It really doesn't sound. I mean, that sounds like a bunch of people from maybe somewhere in the Old Testament. And here we're talking about something about down near the end of this world's history, if, if we're to believe what seems to be presented here. So what kind of idols do people worship in our day? What kind of thefts are going on? Uh, is this just talking about... Um, the people who do heists, or well, what the, are all those things? The about? last one is murders. We got a lot of that going on. Yeah. Sorcerers. That's kind of yeah. spiritualism. We have the, a lot of that going on. There's plenty of illicit sex, mm -hmm. and then a lot of that. So it's pretty con It's pretty okay. uh, pretty current. Well, let's let's just have a look and see <laughs> what brings us up to that conclusion. In, in these groups of seven, as you know, the book of Revelation focuses on sevens, but stay tuned because we're going to come to some very interesting sixes in a few chapters. But so far, we're focused on seven. We have seven churches and seven seals, and today we're going to talk about seven trumpets. Um, what were these trumpets all about? Well, it seems that the trumpets are a focus on groups of people who should have known about Christianity, but maybe didn't, and received certain kinds of judgments from God because of their failure to learn what they could have learned. That's a, just a real quick look, but let's, let's just um, go through this and see what we, can, what we can come up with. Between the seals and the trumpets, we talked about with seals last time, we have noted the angels between the sixth and seventh. And remember that in these sequences, we have, in, in most of the sequences, we have six that are sort of one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there's a break. And it, in that break, it says, God calls, he, God calls for action on the part of his people. Then he says, there will be a reward for those who are faithful. And then there's the seventh in the sequence, which usually is directly connected with the second coming of Christ. So looking back at the seals and the trumpets, we notice that there are, if, well, in fact, let's just look at that. Look at Revelation 7, 1 and 2. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, I'm reading from the Good News Bible, holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on the earth or the sea or against any tree. And I saw another angel come up from the east with the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud, loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea, and so said so forth, and it goes on. So we see here that the angels have come up, and what have they said? Hold, right? Don't damage. Hold on. Wait. Okay? And what happens in the, 
in the trumpets, we would see a lot of judgment going on, right? And when we come to the seventh seal, which is the very first verse in our chapters 8 and 9 we're talking about tonight, or today, when the Lamb broke open the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, we talked about that just very briefly last time. A half an hour? What is a half an hour? What, what are we talking about here? Does this mean from 6.30 to 7.30, or does it mean something different than that? Could mean a week. A week? How did you get from a half an hour to a week? By um, one day equals a year. Okay, in prophetic time, we have this idea that a day, and there's lots of references for that. We'll talk about some more of those a little bit later. Lots of references where a day represents a year. So if one day with 24 hours represents a whole year with 52 weeks, then if you divide up to one hour, one hour would be approximately two weeks, right? That's half of 52, 24 and 52 is a little over two times. So a little over two weeks. And a half an hour would be approximately one week, right? So there's silence in heaven for about half an hour. But hold on just a minute. In chapters 4 and 5, we talked about the gathering around the throne of God. And who was there? Do you remember? 24 elders. And 24 elders, elders and four living creatures. And who else? Thousands and thousands. Millions thousands. of yeah. angels. Yeah. How could there be silence with all those people there? Maybe they aren't there. Maybe they aren't there. How could that be? Well, they've gone off on a trip to see something pretty important. Okay. And what would that be? The culmination of things here on earth. His okay. second coming. We're, we've said already that the seventh in each one of these sequences usually represents something that's very near or at the second coming of Christ. Now... If you had been one of the beings that lived in another part of the universe and you had watched the whole great controversy unfold from the beginning, from the time there was rebellion in heaven and war in heaven, through the temptation of Adam and Eve, all the way through the history of the great controversy to the very end, and God says, okay, now's the time. Let's go down to this earth. It's time to wrap it all up. You think you'd want to be there? I can't imagine anybody who wouldn't want to be there. It may not be silence in just heaven. It may yeah. be silence in the rest of the universe. Yeah. yeah. And their, their attention is going to be focused. Yeah. Even if they're not physically there, you know, we know that we can speak and God can hear us yeah. wherever. And he, he's present everywhere. We don't know how all that works. But, you know, the focus is going to be on what Jesus is coming to do at the second coming. No question about that. Well, if we understand what God is really trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. then this is, is, a, is, I hate to use the term, a singularity which will never be repeated again. Yep. That uh, there was war in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, there was rebellion of Lucifer cast to this earth, mm -hmm. the creation of this earth, mm -hmm. all to answer the, the, the charges mm -hmm. uh, that Satan leveled against God all to answer, uh, to, to repel that war, that the, the universe will be fundamentally different after his second coming than it was at any time prior, yep. that the universe will now be more secure mm -hmm. than it had, uh, has ever been. Yes. And, and that is, I believe, God's goal. Now, are no. you saying that all the beings from all the universe are going to be getting front row seats around the earth as Jesus or just before Jesus comes? The founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church said that when Jesus comes on that occasion, there will be so many angels here for the occasion that the entire sky will be filled with bright, shining angels. Imagine looking up and every space you can see in the sky is full of angels. Mm -hmm. That's just the angels. That's not counting the other beings in the universe. So I think it's going to be a pretty awesome display. But like he said, there may be mechanisms that we don't know about yeah. that would give everybody a front row seat. Yeah. 
-hmm. They'll be able to see, even if they're far away somewhere, they'll be able to see. We will be at the stage of the Hollywood Bowl, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this interpretation is saying that silence means nobody's there. But hold on, because now I'm going to challenge you, because now, now we're going to go to the end of the trumpets. We just talked about the end of the seals. The end of the seals, seven seals says silence. Look now at, the, at Revelation 11. We're going to jump ahead for a little bit. 11.15, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The power to rule over the world belongs now to our Lord and his Messiah, and he will rule forever and ever. Then the twenty-four elders will sit on their thrones in front of God, who th sit on their thrones in front of God, threw themselves face downwards and worship God, and there's a whole psalm of their worship. Now, is that a contradiction? No, that's the get up and go ceremony. <laughs> okay, that's the get up and go ceremony. Well, you're saying that that's the ceremony before everybody exits heaven to see yeah. what's going to mm -hmm. happen on that, earth? That was just a thought that came into my mind. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. It's either a get up and go ceremony or maybe it's a ceremony after it's all done. Could be. Could be Could both. Be. Either yeah. one. Well, <clears throat> so that's what you're saying though, that quiet means nobody there. Well, at least it means whoever's there. It's, their focus isn't on rejoicing about what God is doing here and there and other parts of the universe. Their focus is on one thing, and everybody's watching to see what's going to happen. I, there's one thing in the Bible that comes to mind when talking about quiet for a week, and that's Job's friends that saw him. Mm -hmm. So they exactly. were there, but they were so mortified at the, the they situation, saw. they were quiet. That's right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I guess that would be a parallel, though. The, the current event that was taking place kept them quiet and the it kept it kept all their attention and I think that would parallel what, what Ken is saying the current event the second coming of Christ captures the entire intention now we've also suggested that the book of Revelation is constructed like a giant V and what we're doing we're coming down on one side and we're looking at historical events down here like this and we're going to get to what it comes up in a couple of weeks, the section on the, the, at the bottom of the V. This is Revelation 11, verse 19 through 14, verse 20, the core of the book of Revelation. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But as you start going back up the other side, there are parallels. So we're going to see that these trumpets are a kind of warning judgments, if you will, saying, okay, Here's people who didn't pay attention to God's call, who refused, they went their own way, and look what happened to them. And now, in the future, now we're going to talk, when we get past that, that central piece of the V, we start going up this other side, we're going to talk about events that happened at the end of this world's history, all the way to the third coming, and we're going to see that those are final judgments. So here's the warning judgments, here's the final judgments. What comparison would you make between the warning judgments and the final judgment? What, what sort of a comparison do you suppose would be there? Anybody? Just, just in general. Think the warning judgments are more severe or the final judgments are more severe? Well, in both of them you die. Yeah. And one of them lasts a lot longer than the other one. Well, and not only that, the warning judgments, a relatively few people die. Yeah. In the final judgments, a lot of people die. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's the reason for the death in both cases? Ignoring God's instructions. Yeah. So there's a parallel. So well, you're talking about the V, one side's the seals and the other side's the trumpets? No, no. Uh, the seals and the trumpets are all on this side. We don't get to, we don't get to the other side till we talk about the plagues and we talk about the harlot sitting on the beast and so forth like this going up the other side. Isn't there a lot of places in the Bible where something happens on a local scale and later on in the Bible it's a g worldwide scale? It is. And this is the same thing. The warning is given by example. And if you don't learn by this example, you're going to be involved in the worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar. Mm -hmm. Yes, Gordon. In support of, of your concept, the, the warning that we receive for whatever event is almost always less than the real catastrophe to come, whether it's the warning of a storm or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. okay. give, give an example of what, you, what you're thinking of there. Well, 
it wouldn't make any sense to have the warning be more severe than the event to come. Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. Now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do a little experiment. You ready? You all with me? Turn to Revelation eight, uh, starting with verse six. And now I'm going to ask you, get out your Bible, open if you will. I'm going to read from my Good News Bible. It's easier to understand. It's, it's modern language, modern English, American English, if you'll forgive us, those of you who come from other countries. Um, but here we're going to read this and see if, it, if the meaning just sort of jumps out at you, and we'll see where we go from there. Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. And that's what you would expect them to do with trumpets, right? The first angel blew his trumpet. Hail and fire mixed with blood came pouring down on the earth. A third of the earth was burnt up, a third of the trees and every blade of green grass. Is the, end, is the meaning of that obvious? Then the second angel blew his trumpet. Something that looked like a huge mountain on fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea was turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of ships were destroyed. Is that any better? Is this parallel to the plagues? Well, hold that question. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about that. And the answer is yes. But let's we're going to talk about this later. Okay. Then the third angel blew his trumpet. A large star, burning like a torch, dropped from the sky and fell on a third of the rivers and on, on and on the springs of water. The name of the star is bitterness. A third of the water turned bitter, and many people died from drinking the water because it had turned bitter. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet. A third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that their light lost a third of its brightness. There was no light during a third of the day and a third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard an angel that was flying high in the air, saying in a loud voice, O oh, horror, horror, how horrible it will be for all who live on earth when the sound comes from the trumpets that the other three angels must blow. And then the next three angels are in, in chapter 9. I'm not going to take time to read the whole chapter, but those are even worse things, uh, we'll, we'll talk about them more in a little bit, than the first four. And is it, is it obvious to people what this is talking about? Do you think the churches that first heard this message had any idea what in the world John was talking about? I, I'm sure some of them were clueless because I think I would be absolutely clueless. But maybe I would not. Okay, let's review. Where, the, where are they? The people who are listening to this that read for the first time, what's going on in their environment? Persecution. 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 These are the days of Domitian, the first really large-scale large persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. And what's happening? Do we, do we remember? Domitian was the first of the emperors to really enforce emperor worship. He claimed that he was God. And you had to come at least once a year to a designated spot in your area, and you had to take some incense from a, a spot, and you had to carry it over and place it on, an, on this altar and say, Domitian is Lord. Well, Christians couldn't do that because we believe there's only one Lord. And so it was a life or death situation for them. And, I mean, all the implications of that, many, many Christians lost their lives because they refused to, quote, worship this madman, if you will. Well, at least if they got the message of uh, verse 2, mm -hmm. I saw the seven angels which stood before God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are God's angels, mm -hmm. and uh, they're going to blow, and all of this stuff happens. Well, they would think that that's God's good angels aren't going to be blowing on, on his faithful people. No. So they would look at this and say, this must going to be happen to somebody else. somebody else. Yes. And they'd probably kind of like that. Okay. Well, if you had a question of what the third meant, mm -hmm. wouldn't that kind of ring in your mind as it's being read to you? Yeah. We well, heard a lot of thirds, up, didn't we? Yeah. You come up later on where in Revelation 12, where a third of the angels fall out from the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you would start seeing a connection there. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's coming up in just a couple of chapters. But that's what I'm thinking, that maybe the, 
the question of a third would be on their minds, what in the world does one third mean? And then, then this other part of the revelation comes up and it talks about the third of the angels that fell. Okay, now let's, let's build our picture here now. John starts out with talking about, okay, you people in Ephesus, you people in Smyrna, da, 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 down to Laodicea, mm -hmm. okay? And they all knew what he was talking about, right? Now, we have put some additional interpretations to those churches, but they all knew what those churches were about. Then he goes to talking about a wider sort of circumference in the seals, okay? And we scholars have looked at this and said, you know, these seal sequence, which we talked about last time, probably refers to Western civilization after it, well, in the process of being, quote, Christianized. And now remember, that's under the Roman Empire and then under the Roman Catholic Church, so forth. Now, the, the, this, the, the picture gets even large and spreads out, and un, scholars, again, I'm, we're just going to propose this as a possibility. Scholars are saying now we're going to look at in the trumpet sequence, we're going to say, okay, there are other groups of people, not, not Christian, just the Christian churches, not just the, the people within the circle that claim to be Christians. What's going on with other groups? What, what happened to the Jews? What happened to the Muslims coming up, etc.? Other groups that sort of interact with Christians in this Mediterranean world that, that Paul, I mean, yeah, the, the, or that John in this case was talking about. Is that then a contrast between Christianity and the rest of whatever's going on out there? We're going to look at that. That's a very distinct possibility. So if you were going to now to do two things, thinking, okay, this seems to be dealing with a larger group of people, number one, and two, we're going to try to make a chronological sequence of things down through history that's affected groups that are maybe competitors to Christianity, groups surrounding Christianity, what would be the first major disaster, let's say, for example, that happened to Jews, Muslims, other groups that were in competition with Christians? The uh, destruction of Jerusalem? Absolutely. So maybe the first trumpet could refer to the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the homeland for the Jews, okay? That would fit with the, what, with what was going on in the first centuries. What about the next four or five centuries? What else might have been happening? What other major religious events happened in the next four or five centuries? Well, just getting back to that, okay. that one there. Um, the first trumpet was the hail, right? Vegetation. The, the first time trumpet was destroying the vegetation, the grass, right, and all by the that. hail. So, uh, why uh, would that hail fit with no. hail and fire? Well, then, oh, okay. why would that? Blood. Why would that parallel a destruction of a city? Well, okay. Remember that we're talking about a third. We're talking about the thirds here. Mm -hmm. The third implies. Again, I'm 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 relying on scholars who said they've done a lot of work on the original languages. I'm not saying you have to believe all of this, but a third seems to imply a major portion. I'm sure this is not exactly 33.3%. I mean, it's talking about a major portion of whatever we're talking about, okay? Mm -hmm. So if we look at the Jewish nation as a nation, and Jerusalem is destroyed, and all the people in Palestine are destroyed, what percentage of Judaism do you suppose that represents? Just off the top of your head. A yes. third. Well, somewhere in that ballpark, because there's still a lot of Jews over in Babylon, Baghdad, that area of the world Alexandria. that never returned to Palestine. There's a huge number of Jews, in fact, probably more Jews down in Egypt than there were in Palestine. So if you wipe out the Jews in Palestine, we're talking eh, somewhere about a third. A big group. A big group. Less than half. Yeah, and certainly a major focus for the Jewish people. Right? I mean, the temple in Jerusalem was certainly a center for them. No question about it. Okay? Do we, can you think of any other major religious movements that came up within the next few centuries? Well, there's the, there's the persecution of the Christian church. Yeah. There's the establishment. Okay, the persecution of the Christian church, that was back with the seals. Okay. And now we're talking about, 
We're talking about groups that are not Christian now. Okay. Can you think of one? Another group? Well, Islam. 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 Yes. A huge group. Islam is coming up. We want to keep an idea what, I mean, to keep an eye on what's going on with, with Islam. And there's, and you can, you can discuss this, but one possibility that we might be talking about is the split of the Christian church between Catholicism and Orthodoxy, the, the, the Greek, the Eastern Orthodox groups. This is a breakup of, of Christianity into groups, and they're becoming less and less Christian as, as time goes on. That was a huge event which is hardly even touched on. Okay. In chapter, chapter 9, verse 5. Mm -hmm. The locusts were not allowed to kill these people, but only to torture them for five months. Yes. Now, five months, five times 30 is 150. Yes. 150 years. And when do you think that was? Well, uh, I've, I've heard it explained, and I, I display my ignorance uh, in, in bringing it up, but it has to do with a time period with reflected uh, Muhammad and his, his, his rule. Okay. Muhammad himself really didn't do a lot of warfare. He suggested warfare, but when he died, people who followed him said, we're going to spread this, come hell or high water, we're going to spread this religion all over the world, and we're going to do it by warfare, if no other means. They spread across North Africa, they spread up through the Middle East, through Palestine and so forth, and they, and they basically took over a huge portion of the world. Trying, and, and basically they said, if you're not an, a Muslim, if you don't belong to Islam, you're a second-class citizen. You can stay here if you want, but you're definitely a second-class citizen. Took over well, most of Spain. Yeah, That's they took over most that. of Spain. They did. What, what was the part, though, that, that um, people longed for death but couldn't find it? Where would that fit in that? Well... That happens for the 150 years, too. Yeah. And that was a time when, when I mean, really, it was... It was the, the 150 years, probably, in light of this, represents the time when the uh, time of Islamic expansion. So they, they had a stinger in the back of their... And they inflicted pain on men so that well, they would want to die, but they couldn't find death. So how would that fit? Well, let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, and let, let me back up a little bit. Yeah, we, we skipped a couple things here, didn't yeah. we? Let, let me back up a little bit and give you sort of an outline that sort of give you a chance to a, in con because if we just started asking but a little bit here and a little bit there and sort of we're gonna we're gonna have trouble covering it all. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Edwin Thiele, who was a real scholar and spent a lot of time studying Revelation, divided it up and he in this way and we're probably gonna have to take a break before I chance, get a chance to finish this. But he suggested that the first trumpet symbolizes the divine judgments that came upon Jerusalem and the Jewish nation when it set itself against Christ and his followers as it represented in, in Revelation 8, 7. The second symbolizes, according to him, the judgments against the Western Roman world as in Revelation 8, 8 and 9. The third fell upon the professed Church of Christ when it allowed itself to become defiled and sent forth streams of death rather than life, and that would be Revelation 8, 10, and 11. And you're going to have to stick around. Stay by while we take a break, and we'll come back and finish our list and talk about what these things all represented.
Welcome back. We're delighted you decided to stick with us. We're looking at a possible explanation of these seven trumpets, and we were up to the fifth trumpet. The fifth trumpet constituted the Mohammedan scourges. I'm sorry. The fourth. The fourth trumpet was the ensuing darkness of the Middle Ages. So there was all this religious warfare and stuff going on, and then basically spiritual darkness settled over the world, basically. And we call that the Dark Ages. The fifth angel, fifth, uh, trumpet. fifth trumpet, I'm sorry, the fifth angel was blowing his trumpet, constituted the Mohammedan scourges that swept over the Middle East and into Europe, and we'll talk more about that. The sixth consisted of the scourges that continued under Turkish control of large sections of Asia, Africa, and, Africa and Europe, Revelation 9, 13 to 11, 14, and the seventh constituted the final terrifying outbreaks of human passion and hate that characterized the final period of Earth's history prior to the second coming of Christ, and that would be chapter 11, verses 15 to 19. Might that be today? Well, that's what we have to ask ourselves. So how do you suppose he arrived at these conclusions? What, conclu what clues did he have? I mean, there's nothing in those verses that we read that says Israel or Islam or whatever. How did he come up with those conclusions? Well, some of it was movement of population. Okay. I think that comes in under the beginning of Turkish control. They came out of East, Western Russia, mm -hmm. what we would call Western Russia. Mm -hmm. So there was an ebb and flow of different nationalities yeah. as we know them today. Okay. Anybody else have an idea? What we have seen is, and again, here, let's, let's, we're talking in a certain context here. M remember that many of our Christian brothers and sisters, not of the Adventist persuasion, believe that all these things somehow or other fit back into the days of the Roman Empire. So what we're going to say now, they would say, you know, we don't believe God has the power to predict the future, so how could he know those things? And if you, if you believe God doesn't have the power to predict the future, then you're going to have some problems with what we're going to say now. So you're saying that, that they thought these events all related to things that happened in John's day or before. Okay. Is that here's, what you're saying? Yes. Here's, here's, what, here's what happened. Nero, as you remember, was the emperor in the days of the death of Peter and Paul, the 80, late 80s, 60s, well, 80s, 60s, which roughly. And he was the first emperor that started the idea that emperors should be worshipped as God. Now, there, I, when I say that, there were, there were some hints of that before, but he was the first emperor that sort of said, yeah, I think that's a good idea, call me a god. The other emperors before that said, oh, okay, if you want to, okay. But they didn't make any big deal out of it. So now, here comes Nero, and when Nero died, you know, after a rel at a relatively young age, there was a whole cult that, that rose up and they actually built temples and worshipped Nero because they believed Nero was coming back again, that he was going to rise from the death, dead, and he was going to once again rule the Roman Empire, etc. So some of our friends believe that all these signs which we apply, all these events which we apply to the second coming of Jesus Christ, really apply to the reappearance of Nero in this phony cult that people worshipped and pagans worshipped in the old days. So which means that the book of Revelation then is not about Christians or anything that we might believe, anything about the future, but was about something that happened in those days dealing with a pagan cult. So they're saying that, um, that all this came up from the imagination of John, that um, it... In, he would know what was going on at that time, and that he would aim for that yeah. and nothing else. Yeah. Well, what makes that hard to believe that God cannot predict the future is that prophecies of old have come true. Every and they one were, of them. They were written long before they became true, and they became true. So if we have all that as a foundation, why should not we believe that John was actually shown visions of the actual end of the world? Here's, here's the challenge. And here's a special challenge for you Seventh-day Adventists out there listening. If you take the books of Daniel and Revelation seriously, 
and you do your math and you look up the prophecies and you believe that God has the ability to predict the future. And if you say, okay, there's 490 years, you know, set aside for the Jewish nation, and there it happened exactly on time. And then you say, then there was a 1260 year prophecy and it happened exactly on time, right on time the Pope was rest rested in 1798. And then you look at the 2300 day prophecy and it comes down to 1844. Pretty soon you almost, if you're gonna believe all those things are real prophecies of God, that that's really what the Bible says, you almost have to be a Seventh-day Adventist. So what do you do if you don't want to go that route? You have to start making up stories about, well, maybe it means this, maybe it means that, maybe it's some pagan thing we're talking about here. And because if you want to take it seriously, you want to start saying, yes, this could literally be true, then you're, you're, you're in that pathway. So what you're saying, if I, if I understand correctly, is you can look at these verses and, 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 and make imaginations and, and make them mean almost anything. Yeah. The reason that we take the view that we do is because it becomes then consistent with the rest of, of Scripture and, and puts it together in an in a understandable whole. Yes. And that's the primary reason yeah. why we believe it. Yes. So now, in light of that, we have said, okay, we see a pattern of the seven churches mm -hmm. from John's day to our day. Mm -hmm. We see a pattern in the seven seals from John's day to our day. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that the seven trumpets are also from John's day to our day? It would be tempting to do that, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so that's what, that's what Dr. Thiele did, and that's why he came up with these things. He said, these look like events happening in religious groups, you know, sort of standing around Christianity or maybe in the periphery of Christianity. Things that happened were major events. I'm talking about you start splitting up the Christian church between Eastern and Western. You talk about the rise of Islam. You talk about the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jews. These are not minor events. These are huge things that happen. So let's see if they fit in this pattern. Lo and behold, they seem to fit. This it looks like the destruction of Jerusalem. It looks like this, da, da, da. Now, you can't, I can't say absolutely it means that and nothing else could possibly mean. No, but it looks like it might fit. Sure. Yeah. Can we also look at it as kind of forward thinking rather than from history? Because a lot of people think that like the one third this and one third that refers to, like in Zechariah mm -hmm. 14, refers to maybe nuclear mm -hmm. things that's going to happen in the future. And how uh, when their flesh will, write, will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their mm -hmm. eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouth. Mm -hmm. A lot of people relate that to n nuclear reaction. Yeah, mm -hmm. but now you're already jumping over to the parallel and the plagues. Okay. So you, we're, we're talking still about the warning judgments. You're already talking about Before. the final judgments. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's, let's hold that until we get there, okay? okay. Your, your question is fair, but we don't want to go there yet. Dennis? I don't want to get too far ahead here. We, we've talked about the the uh, five months, the 150 years. Tim Rosenberg draws a very clever graph of uh, the rise in Christian power, the fall in Christian power, the rise in the power of Islam. Yeah. And, and these are cycling on and off until our day when they both seem to be cycling on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, John's readers could not sit down and read this and come to a, a complete understanding. Because no. if we look at the five months, if we look at the three and a half years, those three and a half years cannot be identified un until the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Positively, it, they can't. They can't be dead, yeah. Because, because it's, it's not a prophecy that starts with an event. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, uh, a prophecy that ends with an event. It, it's just a time period. Mm -hmm. It's just 1260 years, and so you have to keep looking, you're looking through history, looking through history, and all of a sudden something big happens, and it turns out to be just 1260 years. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But also, Dan, Daniel's an example of writing down something he didn't understand, yeah. and he worried that he didn't understand it. So it, 
I guess it shouldn't be too surprising that maybe John was writing things that he saw and was given. He may not have understood it. Uh, we, can, we can try to imagine what the churches that, that it went to understood. Okay, well, let's keep moving. We're, we're, we're going to run out of time. For these sound like fairly wild and even destructive things going on in these trumpets, don't they? Yes. Suggesting maybe warfare? Was there warfare connected with the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes. yes. Was there warfare connected with the rise of Islam? Absolutely. Yes. Was there warfare connected with the breaking up of the Christian church between West and East? Definitely. Yeah. So it looks like these episodes of warfare down through these trumpets probably are talking about major military events. Now, is God saying that when you follow God's ways, you prosper, things go well. Mm -hmm. Is God warning that when you don't follow my ways, this is, this is how you're going to end up, that, that you know, like uh, Adam and Eve were told in the garden, mm -hmm. you'll eat of this apple and you will die. Mm -hmm. And if you go against God, things don't end up well. Mm -hmm. And they don't end up well, they end up as a trumpet. Mm -hmm. So... Let's pick another example. In the sort of demise of the empire of Rome, and with it the rise of the spiritual Rome, if we want to call it that, was there warfare? Yes. Yeah. There were attacks on Rome, multiple attacks on Rome, remember. Uh, the Vandals, one of the interesting groups that, and were they, and just in, in, in passing really quickly, there were three groups that had a very different religious views among those ten horns that rose up in, in Daniel and so forth. And who were the three, the, the three horns that had very different religious views that were uprooted? Ostrogoths. The Heruli, the, the Vandals, yeah. and the Ostrogoths. Okay, well, actually, the, well, some people put Heruli and some people put the Visigoths. Some people both put the, the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths together. So yeah, so you could say there's four groups, but they all sort of melt into three. And these were groups that believed in what? As opposed to the total of, Christi of Christianity. They had an Arian heresy. Okay, Arian heresy. What's an Arian heresy? They believed that Jesus Christ was a created or a de novo being. That he did not exist from the beginning with the Father. Yes, exactly. And so what happens in this spiritual war? Those entire groups were wiped out by spiritual conflicts, literally by wars that were motivated by religious things. So, is this a, about the fifth century? Is that you're yeah, talking about? Fourth, fourth and fifth century, yeah. Fourth and fifth century. You know yeah. what's amazing is Jesus didn't say, if you don't believe with me, believe me, or believe what I'm saying, I'm going to kill you. No. He never said that. No. And yet, Christians. If you don't agree with them, they say, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. Very good point. Well, an interesting little, little sidelight here. The Vandals moved to North Africa. That was their headquarters. And they had a fleet of ships, and they would sail out from North Africa, and all of a sudden they would attack. In those days, of course, there was no way of knowing that was, well, something was happening. They would plan an attack, and they would attack a major city. They even attacked Rome a couple of times and just basically they would descend on, but nobody was prepared. They would completely wipe out everything. And they, then they wouldn't necessarily kill all the people, but they would just go through the place and took every, would take anything they thought was of any value and go take it back to North Africa again. That's where we get our word vandalism. Yes. Vandalism. Vandalized. Yeah. This is where it came from. Okay. One of the interesting things that they took back to North Africa with them was the seven-branched solid gold lampstand made by Moses himself at the foot of Mount Sinai. I mean, in his helpers at Mount Sinai. Because that, that lampstand had gone to Jerusalem, stayed in Jerusalem until Jerusalem was destroyed. It was carried off by the Romans and all the way back to Rome. And if you visit the, the arch there that it's, it's in the entrance to the Roman Forum. There it is. You see them carrying the seven-branch candlestick to Rome. And now the vandals grabbed that seven-branch candlestick and took it to Africa. And we don't know what happened to it after that. We don't that. know where it is Whether today. it got melted down or what happened, we don't know. 
but just an example of the kind of stuff they were doing. So here we have, we have wars that are happening based on differences in religious beliefs. You see how this is unfolding? Well, what about the third trumpet? Wormwood, the bitter star, it falls from heaven. What's that talking about? Some people would like to suggest that we have here a, a mention of Satan himself. Jesus said, I saw Satan do what? From heaven. Like Fall that. like lightning from heaven. And who do you think is responsible for all these religious conflicts? Not God. Satan. Satan. Not God. So he's right in the middle of all of this, isn't he? The fourth trumpet. What happens? Revelation 8, verse 12. Look at that real quick. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that their light was lost a third of its brightness. There was no light during a third of the day or a third of the night. What could that possibly mean? That's the dark ages. The dark ages. Sure. Wouldn't that be suggestive of dark ages? I mean, it's... Pretty dark. <laughs> pretty dark, right. <laughs> exactly. And then, of course, we come to the fifth trumpet, um, which... And I'm not trying to read the whole, the whole section. But here we have horses, grasshoppers that look like horses and, and, and shields on, their, on them and, and hair that flows down behind them and ta horses with scorpion, tails that sting like scorpions and so forth. What could that possibly refer to? Anybody have a... The Muslims, hordes of... Okay, them. and... What did they do? They swept across North Africa. They crossed the mouth of the Mediterranean, whatever you choose to call it, the, the little area there between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, and landed on the, on the, on the, mount, the, the big rock there in Gibraltar and moved up through Spain. They started out with only 7,000 troops, but they were so good at warfare that they conquered all of Spain. And they were moving into, into France, and what happened? Got stopped. Got stopped by what happened? How did they get stopped? Well, there's a king up there waiting for him. There was Charles Martel up there with his group of, of, and they were both, they had two armies there that was so closely balanced. They looked at each other and they said, this is going to be a fight to the finish. Mm -hmm. And they knew it was going to be a real battle. And finally they, 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 they had at it. And the Christians managed to force the Muslims back again uh, away, from, away from Europe. Otherwise, Europe would have ended up being a Muslim dynasty, a Muslim hegemony or whatever. You so France did a really good job there, huh? The Christians okay. in France. And how was it, an interesting another little tidbit, how was it that the Christians happened to beat the Muslims on this occasion? They had a new weapon. You know what the new weapon was? Stirrups on their horses. Stirrups on their horses. They found out that the, the, they had invented stirrups to put on saddles and their horses, and they could maneuver better by standing up with their, with their javelins and so forth, standing up on those stirrups, than the Muslims could who didn't have stirrups. And that actually helped them to beat Islam and force it back. And another little tidbit. So there were no stirrups before that? Yeah. No. Oh. That was their modern weapon, weapon of the day. <laughs> It gave you a solidity. If you've ever ridden a horse bareback, you know you better oh, yeah. go with the horse. You yeah. can come off easily, but if you've yeah, got yeah. stirrups, you've got leverage. Yeah, exactly. You got, if you've got a saddle that's, that's tight and stirrups, you've got, you got room to maneuver. Yeah, exactly. That was their modern weapon. Just another little tidbit in, in passing. Um, Gibraltar, where did the name Gibraltar come from? Rock. Latin. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> Latin word? No. It comes from some word I don't remember. It's an Arabic word. Okay. And what does it mean? I think you better tell us. Jabar is a rock of Tariq. Tariq was the name of the gem general who led the Muslims up and conquered Spain. So this is the rock of Tariq, Gibraltar. And they dropped off the IQ at the end. So that's how it got, the, that's how it got its name. And where is the Rock of Gibraltar? I don't know. It, it, if, you, if you go Spain? down to Spain and you come to the place that's 
closest to North Africa. It's what, 50 miles across there or less than that? Less than that. Less than that. Okay. It's the gate to the Mediterranean. It's the gate to the Mediterranean. British and colony. and that, today, that's a, that's a tiny little piece of England. Yes. It belongs to England, a little piece of England stuck on the end of Spain there. So, okay, well, just enough for, for that. So now, what, what, do, what, what happened then? What happened to the, the, the Muslim hordes over the next, let's say, millennium? They, they originally made this huge expansion, then what happened? Did Remember? they shrink again? No, not really. They kind of went west, didn't they? They, they went west, the and then they, they went both west and east. Mm -hmm. They kind yeah. of took over the Mediterranean. They, they obviously the took over the North Africa, no question about that. And they moved, and some of them went all the way east into Russia and China and established a, uh, an Islamic territory, which is still there. If you go into uh, western China, what do you find there? A huge group of people that are basically Islam, belong to Islam. And southern Russia, or not Russia so much, but what used to be USSR, all those nations are Stan, Stan, this, Stan, Stan, that. Those are all Muslim nations. So they had moved out there. Well, uh, what happened was that a, a group of, well, the, 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 the push of the, of the Muslims was stopped at Constantinople because the, it was well fortified, strong walls and so forth, and they couldn't get in there. And what country is that? That's in Turkey. That's in the very western part of Turkey. It's on the, just across the, uh, the, the, the water brought, divide between Europe and, and, uh, and Asia. Okay. And finally, the Muslims developed huge brass cannons, and they shot stone cannonballs, huge cannonballs. And these cannons were so large that they, they, they couldn't be moved. So they would, they would actually, uh, they'd actually construct, melt and put together brass in that spot to make a huge cannon, and then they would carve these big stone cannonballs, and they finally managed to, to conquer Constantinople and turn it into Istanbul as it is today by just these firing these cannons, just keep firing. They got them aimed just right so they would hit the walls and they sh just finally shot enough of them so they just busted down the walls and managed to break their way into this last Christian stronghold and in, 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 in tore down the, the city of Constantinople. And that didn't happen until 1453 AD. That was after the time of printing it's only 75 years before the Protestant Reformation. Wow. So. so th and that's in what trumpet? That was in the fifth trumpet. In the fifth trumpet. So we're not going to... Uh, the modern... Well, I, I'm, I, I see I look at our clock here. We need, to, we need to move on. The sixth trumpet, what's going on there? We need to talk about the end of this. Horses, lots of horses. Okay, and 200 million horsemen. Look at Revelation 9, verse 16. I was told the number of the mounted troops, it was 200 million. What would that represent? Um, and in my vision, I saw the horses and the riders. They had breastplates, red as fire, blue as sapphire, uh, yellow as sulfur. Horses' heads were like lions' heads, and from their mouths came out fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of humanity was killed by those three plagues, the fire, the smoke, and the sulfur coming out of the horses' mouths, and so forth. And we believe this is an extension of, of the wars that resulted from Islam um, in those days. Um, what is... So and this had a major impact even on the future of Europe. Do you know why? Over the next several hundred years, as Protestantism became a major force in Western Europe, Charles V, who was the Christian emperor, he, and a Catholic emperor by that time, really wanted, he, what he really wanted to do was crush out Protestantism as it was on its rise. But he was presented, do, prevented from doing so because of the attack of the Muslims from the East. So he had to focus his attention and his military fighting the Muslims from the East, so he didn't have time to focus on tearing down the Protestant Reformation as it was just getting started. So 
maybe God used the Muslims to do one or two good things for the rise of Protestantism in, at the time of the Protestant Reformation. In the couple minutes we have left, let's back off now and say, what big picture do we see here? We've talked about a lot of little things. What's the big picture we see? If you were, if you were one of the churches that first heard this read, you would look back and down at this and you would say, whoa, a third is killed here and a third is killed there and a third is killed here. This looks like an awful time to come. Maybe the persecution we are suffering today isn't the last of the persecutions. Maybe there's a lot more trouble coming, right? Wouldn't that be the natural conclusion? That'd be pretty discouraging, wouldn't it? It would be pretty discouraging, you would think. But this is not the end. We always need to remember that there's the rest of the book of Revelation. And if you look at this and you say, it could be encouraging in this one sense, and that's you say, we're not the only people who are going to suffer persecution. Christians are going to suffer persecution all the way down through the ages. But what's going to be the end of it? You come over to Revelation 21 and 22. What's going to be the final conclusion? Be rewarded. Jesus comes and rescues us. God will triumph in the end, and all the people who are faithful to him will be saved. This is one of those things where Dr. Maxwell used to say in the book of Revelation, it's kind of like a camera yeah. that looks up into heaven and things are beautiful and glorious and everybody's praising and happy. It looks down here and things look pretty ugly pretty and there's ugly. war and they're pretty nasty. Bad. And it does that a couple of times and it ends up okay. Yes, because it ends up with heaven coming down to That's this right. earth and this becoming God's future headquarters. Right. So I think that what the people who were in, there in John's day, as they looked at all this, they probably said, oh dear, 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 dear. But when they got to the end, they, they could say, hallelujah, Jesus is coming back. It's going to be a victory in the end, and we all can be a part of it. It's not going to be a total destruction. Not all Christianity is going to be wiped out, which might have seemed very likely in their day. That's right. It's going to survive through all these persecutions, all these awful things that come up against it. It's still going to survive, and it's going to triumph in the end with Jesus and his, and his Father coming down to this earth to set up their headquarters here. We'll see you again next week.